So in the last class, we had started looking at the quantum theory, or rather the macroscopic quantum theory behind superfluidity. This is a macroscopic quantum theory in the sense that we are not really talking about the microscopic interactions between the particles which make up the superfluid. We are just going to assume, following Landau, and in a way taking a cue from Tisa and London's BEC version of the theory, that the superfluid part of the fluid, so liquid helium, to remember, is made out of both a superfluid part and a normal fluid part. We are going to assume that the superfluid part is in a macroscopic quantum state. So that's what we did the last day. You describe it by a wave function. That is, all the particles are described essentially by the same wave function. They're all in the same state. So this is the magnitude, which is a real number, times this theta rt. So this is the phase of the thing. And uh, usually, shine mod square is related to the probability density for a wave function. But here, since it's the, it would have been a probability density if we were really talking about one particle. But here you're talking of many, many particles at the same time. So its square really is the density, or at least the superfluid density, not the density of all the atoms which make up helium-2, but the superfluid fraction of that. So this density may change with position and time. And all I've done is rewritten this chi 0 rt as square root of the superfluid density, a number of particles in a unit volume, and it's the i theta. Right? This was a form that we use for our macroscopic wave function. And the current, that is the superfluid current, is a current carried by a wave function like this, which from quantum mechanics we know is imaginary part of psi star grad psi. We calculated this the last day, and we ended up with this result, that this is actually uh, N, Ns, times H cross by M, gradient of theta. So any question about this? And since a, a current flow, this is a current flow, meaning number current flow as opposed to charge current flow. After all, the helium atoms are neutral. There is no electrical current which is flowing. But this current simply refers to the number of fluid atoms crossing a unit area in unit time. Just like current density would be amount of current crossing an area divided by the area in unit time. Here, it's, it's of the current, instead of the charge, which is flowing in unit time, here is the number of particles. Okay? And for that, elementary theory tells us that this has to be the density of the particles which are flowing, number density, multiplied by the velocity of those particles. So this should be pretty familiar to all of you. And this helps us to identify the superfluid velocity as this quantity, h cross by m gradient of theta. And then an immediate consequence of this that we figured out the other day was curl of Vs has to be zero, being a gradient of a scalar. And this actually gives you that superfluid flow is irrotational. OK. However, this immediately gives rise to another problem, which is uh, if I were to in integrate this voltage, uh, this velocity in any closed loop C, what I'm going to get is simply h cross by L times integral of d theta, the phase factor. And since the closed loop begins and ends at the same point, uh, we are actually talking of theta at the same point. Now, if theta had really been a proper function, then when you come back to the same point, you must have the same value. After all, functions have to be single valued. Given a point, you should be able to tell me the value of the function. On the other hand, 
this phase angle theta, very much like the standard angle theta that we use in polar coordinates, actually is not really a function in the sense that when I go back all the way around and come to, come to this point again, what is necessary is that the wave function has to return to the same value, which means e to the power i theta has to return to the same value, but theta can very well change. And why is that important? Because this integral is really nothing but a change in theta over a closed loop. And once again, if theta had really been a function, change in the theta over a closed loop would have been zero because you are back at the same point. However, because if the i theta is what needs to stay the same, theta can actually change. And theta can change when multiples of 2 pi. So delta theta over a closed loop can be 2 pi times an integer, where integer is, could be 1, 2, 3, 0. 0 is also possible. But, or minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. That's also possible if, you're, if it's going the other way around. So basically, you get h by m times b. So circulation, kappa, in of the superfluid velocity vector in any small loop is quantized. You cannot get any value of the circulation. You can only get multiples of a basic quantity. Okay. So this was covered in the last class. But are there any questions about this? If not, let me remind you of the question that was raised. The question that was that could very well be raised here is line integral of Vs dot dl. Vs, remember, is essentially a gradient. So h plus by m. Or I don't even have to go there. Forget that. This is a line integral over a closed line. So Stokes theorem tells us that this can be related to a surface integral. So what is the theorem? Can anybody remind me of that? Curl of Vs. The curl of Vs integrated dotted with dA integrated over a surface. Which surface is this? Which surface should be integrated over? Complete surface. Okay. What do you mean by complete surface? Closed surface. Total close. Well, which closed surface? After all, this is suppose I have a loop here. This is my loop. And uh, I have delivered okay, unfortunately, I'm drawing this on a piece of paper. And because I'm drawing this on a piece of paper which is two-dimensional, I have to draw a planar loop. But you can try to imagine that this is not planar, right? You can try to imagine that uh, something like this. You can try to imagine that the loop could be something like this. Something like an open book with pages. So these, these are, not, I'm, of course, whatever I draw has to be drawn in a two-dimensional plane. But I think you can use the imagination to figure out that these two sheets are on different planes. So it's like a book which has been opened up. So this loop is not even in a plane. Neither is this loop for all that. For all I care. Now, if this is your loop, okay, which surface should I use? This loop has to have something to do with the surface, right? You, of course, wouldn't believe that the circulation of a vector according to some loop is equal to the integral of curl of that vector over some arbitrary volume, right? It has to depend on this volume has to be somehow related or or the curl of Vs integral over some surface. This surface has to be somehow related to this contour, right? Yes? How is that related? How is it related? What is the relation? This this contour and this surface. In the, this, this has nothing to do with superfluid. This is basically stroke theory. Right? How are these two things related? Come on, elementary Stokes theorem. And you know another one, there's Gauss theorem. 
which says volume integral is it can be related to a surface integral, right? Actually, there's a surface integral is over a closed surface, and you relate that to the volume integral over a volume. But which volume is this? Can it be any volume? Say I have a closed surface like this, some surface of a sphere. I have a I have some some a dot ds which I have integrated over this. Will that be related to the integral of divergence of A over, say, this volume, the volume inside this region? Tell me, what do you think is correct? I'm not asking anything about superfluidity. I'm asking a very basic question about something you studied in the first year, I guess. How is this surface related to this curve? Say I do an integral over this curve. Can I go and do the surface integral over this surface? Yeah. The integral is over this curve. Will this surface work on the right hand side? Yes. The relation is actually the surface has to be one whose boundary is the curve. So you have an open surface, some kind of surface like this, which is which can be of very unusual shape. But the boundary of this surface, that has to be the curves. OK? That's a relationship, right? You know all of this. So you can't just do an integral over any arbitrary surface. But there are actually infinitely many surfaces whose boundary is the curve C. And Stokes theorem tells us that it does not matter which one of them you use. Whichever one of the surfaces you use, you have the same result. Just hold on. Just hold on. OK. So, so that's the relationship. This is how you relate the two. But what is important for us is that in superfluid flow, curl of V is 0, right? So if curl of V is 0 everywhere inside the loop, then this integral has to be 0, right? Because this integral has to be 0. So we are facing a problem. We have, the problem is. If you calculate the circulation, you are getting a g by m times some integer. So circulation is quantized, flow quantization. On the other hand, curl of v being 0 seems to imply that you have to have a 0 circulation. Just Stokes theorem, nothing else is being used here. OK? So the question is, which one is correct? And we actually resolved part of this uh, the last day. We just suppose you have a situation like this. You have two cylinders. And you have to imagine that these are two cylinders pointing at you. So basically, two coaxial cylinders, and you have a superfluid here in between the two cylinders. Now, if your superfluid is in between these two cylinders, then curl of V is zero inside the superfluid, but curl of V is not zero here, right? It's not zero in this region. In fact, it's not even defined in this region. There is no, there is no V here. There is no superfluid there. So curl of V is not defined everywhere inside a loop, which I can take. If I take a loop, some imaginary loop along this, and calculate V dot DL's integral here, I do not have to get a zero because the, the curl of V is zero everywhere the superfluid is. 
And by the way, it's only curl of Vs. The velocity of the superfluid that we are talking about. The curl of Vs is zero everywhere, even inside the loop, but everywhere where there is a superfluid. Here there is no superfluid, so curl of Vs is not zero. Here. Not even defined here. So the Stokes theorem calculation can to apparent Stokes theorem proof that circulation has to be zero because curl is zero will not work in a situation like this. So if you have two coaxial cylinders and you have put a superfluid in between, then it is possible to send the superfluid into circulation and get a non-zero value of the circulation, despite the fact that curl of V is zero. So is this okay so far? This part of the argument, any questions about this? Okay, the next part that, in fact, the next part is what we started the last day, but because of network issues, we had to drop the thing. The basic idea was something like this. Suppose instead of having two cylinders, you just had one cylinder filled with a superfluid. Now, if this were an ordinary fluid like water, and if we had made the whole thing spin, say I make this spin about its axis very fast, then what would happen is you would end up with a concave surface. The surface, if you look at the cross section, the cross section will look like this. In fact, and calculate the cross section. This is an elementary calculation in again in higher secondary classes. This is basically elementary properties of matter. And using that, you can show that basic this surface becomes a parabola. And that's basically because every part of the liquid, say if you look from the top, every part of the liquid is spinning around. And to spin around, move in a circle, you need an inward force, the centripetal force. And that's actually supplied by the fact that the surface actually bends so that the pressure exerted by the liquid has an inward component. And you can use that to calculate the, end, the exact profile of it. But this is because the liquid has been set in motion and you have a circulation here. That is, the velocity vector goes round and the liquid moves in a circle. Now, if I could make, say, a, say such, a, such an apparatus of radius r, let's say spin at an angular velocity omega, the circulation of the liquid near the border, what will that be? That is pretty easy to figure out. That's simply the velocity at the border. That's two, that's simply omega r, right? Velocity of the fluid at the border will be it, it will be moving along with the cylinder, so it will be omega r, standard formula for creating angular velocity to linear velocity. And this is this this velocity is not constant, right? This velocity actually is going round and round. But when you do v r dot dl, then vr and dl are always in the same direction. So v velocity into dl, v dot dl becomes d into dl, and v is the, has a fixed magnitude that goes out. We just end up with omega r into pi r. So this is the circulation of the fluid near the border of such a spinning object if the liquid were to actually spin. And that's quite a, that could be a very large amount, right? Because the r, the radius of the Cylinder could be large, omega could be pretty large. I can spin the cylinder at a very high speed. So I can generate very huge values of kappa. With ordinary liquids, that's not a problem. However, if this were a superfluid, then I will have a huge problem with this issue. Because for a superfluid, remember once again, curl of Vs is zero. And here, you don't have the escape route that you had in this case. You, here you had two cylinders with a superfluid only in the region between them. So for this loop that I drew, Vs did not have zero curl everywhere inside. It had zero curl only in this region where there was superfluid. Here on the other hand, we have a cylinder, just a single cylinder, which we have filled up with a superfluid. Maybe, in fact, maybe we have filled it up with an ordinary fluid. Let's say helium one, that is helium. Four above 2.7 Kelvin and make the whole thing spin. So the whole liquid starts to spin. And then I slowly lower the temperature. Now, it might, you might think that, okay, 
uh, suddenly the thing stops spinning once, go, once the temperature drops below transition. But that's an impossibility. So much angular momentum is this fluid had. Where would that go? So it would keep on spinning, and a large fraction of the part of the circulation, among the circulation will of course be VM circulation, but VS will also have a circulation, but a large circulation. So how do we reconcile that? You have to realize that the escape route that we, how do we reconcile that with the fact that the curl of VS is here? The escape route that we had here is not available any longer here, right? So the question is, will the superfluid spin or not spin? And, uh, well, it may be very difficult to start a superfluid spinning because a superfluid has zero friction, right? So if it was at rest and you started to spin the cylinder, the cylinder would turn, but the superfluid next to it will not because it will not have any uh, frictional effect from the surface. Remember, all the friction is what usually makes things stop. It's also what makes things move. Right? Friction here is what makes things move. Okay. So no friction would mean a superfluid initially at rest if it already is a superfluid. So that is temperature is below 2.7 Kelvin. And you spun the cylinder, then the superfluid will not spin. Of course, the liquid to some extent will spin because part of the liquid is a normal fluid, which has friction with the surface. So part of the liquid will spin, part of it will not. That is part, that's part and parcel of the two fluid model. But if I started the whole thing spinning first, and then lower the temperature below the transition, the superfluid which was already spinning, the part of the part of the fluid which became the superfluid, it was already spinning. It will not stop spinning. It will keep on spinning. So it will have circulation. So. The question is, how do you reconcile these, this statement with curl of Vs is zero? And the answer is, uh, well, answer is slightly non-trivial, or this something which is not very really unfamiliar. But can anybody give me an example of a vector field, some other vector field, not the velocity field of a superfluid, which essentially looks like this? Any vector field diagram that you can remember from your elementary physics classes, where the vector field essentially looks like this. Or the field lines are basically circles. Concentric circles on the kind that I've drawn right now. This remind remind you of anything? Concentric circle field lines. I'm not talking about velocity field, but some field somewhere that you have studied which has field lines as concentric circles like this. In any branch of elementary physics, have you seen this? Either this. Either this picture of the vector field, which where the vectors go round and round like this, or the corresponding picture, corresponding picture here. Yes. Any idea? Okay, let me. Okay, I do. I, I just started drawing it. On the left before asking you the question, so you should know that know what I'm talking about. I started drawing a straight line. I think all of you remember magnetic this, right? Field around uh, around. Magnetic field around a straight current, exactly. Right? If you had a current I, the magnetic field around the straight current goes like this. Okay. So this you have seen something like this. What is the divergence of this magnetic field? Anybody remember that? Mm 
zero. 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 Magnetic resistance of any magnetic field is zero, and it's pretty easy to calculate and show that this is going to be zero. Can you remember what? Do you remember? Can you recall or can you figure out what the curl of this magnetic field is? Here, not at not at not where the wire is, but at this location. What is the curl? Yes. Anybody? Here? You should remember the basic formula which relates curl of B to something else. If you don't know, don't remember what the curl is in this particular problem, which by the way is one of the first things you actually calculate when you study magnetostatics. The increased rate wire field and then the diversion and curl due to it, perhaps. Depend, of course, on which book you read. But uh, even if you did not read, remember this result. Don't you know? You should remember what curl of B is in general, right? It's one of the fundamental equations in physics. Mu not j. Mu not j. Uh, what's that law called? You're saying mu not j, right? Anybody remember the name of this equation? Ampere's law. This is Ampere's law. And of course, this was modified later by Maxwell to bring in an additional term. But for magnetostatics, this is fine. But actually, in our problem, this is correct. But in our problem, it's actually zero, right? Because is there any current here? So any current, any of these points? The current is through this wire, which I'm looking at from the top. So this is, this is the wire pointing straight from here. It's pointing straight out towards you. Okay, but wherever we are, where we are drawing these field lines, is there any current there? Yes. No, sir. No. So, if you were to calculate the curl, or even from Ampere's law itself, curl of B would be zero. Okay. Now I. That might sound like a bit of a surprising thing because if you remember what fields which have curl and we don't have curl, uh, these kind of fields, fields which go round and round, they are typically ones which have curl. Okay. Or at least if you look at a book and see a field which has a curl, it essentially looks like this. Although, frankly, that picture might be misleading. In the sense that that picture is correct, but if it ends up giving you the idea that every field which looks like this has a, has a non-zero curl or has a zero divergence, which of course is correct for the magnetic field, and every field which does not look like this does not fit that description, that is, does not have zero divergence or something like that, that may not be quite right because this is essentially a pretty complicated interplay of various derivatives which come in here. But this is an example of a typical kind of field we assume has circulation and has hence has curl. But here we have circulation. We are going round and round. But you have zero curl. But so this is very, very similar to our VS story. The point is can velocity go round and round and still have non-zero curl? And still have zero curl. Well, you have an example, magnetic field produced by an infinite straight wire has zero curl and still manages to go round and round. The one thing you have to actually bear in mind is the following. Uh, is the curl zero everywhere inside this loop? Suppose I imagine a loop here and try to calculate the circulation of magnetic field in this loop. Is the curl zero everywhere inside? No, sir. Not origin. So, where is it not zero? Origin. Well, origin no, because you're looking at the plane, but basically on the wire, right? The wire carries current, right? Everywhere else. So, it's just in this picture, if you think of this surface by, bounded by the loop, there's only one point where there is a non zero current, but that one point is enough to actually invalidate the argument. That curl of B 
B is zero everywhere and therefore it can't have circulation. Color B is not zero everywhere. It is not zero at this point. Now that was so, but is is that kind of thing something we can use in a superfluid? Here at least you had a wire, right? Some region where super where color B could not be zero because there was a current. Okay. However, at a macroscopic level, you have to realize one thing. Uh, one of the reasons why we could argue something like this, uh, say, if curl is zero, then we cannot have a circulation. That was a, right, another way of arguing that would be, suppose you had a circulation. That means you went around in this loop, and B was pointing all the way along this loop, and you got a non-zero valve for the integral. Now, if I were to move from that to a neighboring smaller loop, can anybody tell me? And given the fact that we know the curl of E S is zero throughout, can you tell me what will the circulation of V S be? Suppose the V S circulation of here was kappa one. What will be the circulation here? In other words, if line integral of V dot DL over this was kappa 1, what is the line integral of V dot DL over this one? A very, very simple question. Remember, we have no curl of Vs is 0. So how are kappa 1 and kappa 2 related to each other? Well, what do you know about the curl of V everywhere in the region bounded by these two loops? We know it's zero, right? And what does it mean? That means that if you take this part inside the two loops, where curl of V is definitely zero, and you integrate to a volume to a surface integral of curl of V. You can relate that to the line integral of V dot DL along the two lines bounding this region. And this, and since the curl of V is zero everywhere, the okay, what, so the question is if I have this region, let's say a region like this, what's the boundary of this shaded region here? Yes. Given a region, you can figure out the boundary, right? Say, if the region was this one. The boundary is pretty easy to figure out, right? The boundary would be this. It goes like this, right? What's the boundary for this gray region? Yes? Any idea? Interior and exterior. Hmm, sorry? Both on the exterior and the interior. So, yeah, there will be two loops actually bounding this. The exterior, the loop on the outside, and another one on the inside. And you want to use toxidum properly, what you would have to do is Traverse this one like this and this inner one like this. And then if you use Stokes theorem, it will be obvious that because curl of V vanished everywhere here, curl of V dot ds integrated over the gray loop is zero. That means line integral of V dot dl over the boundary is zero. Which means line integral of V dot dl over the red curve plus the line integral of V dot dl over the orange curve. These together would give you zero. So they must be negatives of each other. But notice that here, one curve is being traversed counterclockwise, the other one is being traversed clockwise. So if you were to traverse them both in the same direction, so instead of using these arrow, using that, that arrow like that, you use this arrow. Both of these loops must give you the same value. Okay? 
Clear? You have seen this used all the time. Say contour integration. You can deform the contour as long as you don't pass through any any poles. The same idea works. In the region, in, if you have an analytic region, then the integral over the region vanishes. So the integral of the corresponding thing on the boundary would have to be equal. In other words, kappa 1 and kappa 2 in this problem would have to be equal. So that's not a, not a problem in itself. But the problem is I can make this smaller and smaller, right? Notice that this tells me, what does this tell me? It's actually telling me the circulation will stay the same no matter how small I make the loop. And that seems impossible simply because when I make the loop smaller and smaller, the total length of the loop becomes very tiny. And even in this, that means the VS would have to be huge there. And ultimately, when this shrinks down to a point, then VS would have to be infinitely big, which is absurd. Or Basically, if you think in terms of uh, Vs being related to the change in theta, theta, the circulation is related to the change in the phase angle, right? We found that apart from this h cross pi n factor, it's actually the change in the phase angle. So what I'm claiming is whatever change occurs in the phase angle occurs when you go around the blue curve, has to be the same as the change in the phase angle on the green, green curve, then all these various magenta curves. For all of them, the same change in phase has to occur when you go all the way down. But when you get to a point, ultimately finishing the whole thing down and get down to a point, then uh, how can the phase change if you're at, a, at one point? Right? You are at only here earlier, you were going all the way around and coming back to the point. The phase change in the process. But when this point thing really shrunk down to zero, then there was no possibility of a change. Are you with me so far? Yes? Yes, sir. But the one way to escape that would be to realize this, that a complex, apart from this 2 pi thing, 2 pi, what do 2 pi uncertainty, uh, for every wave function, you have a very defined phase. The phase could change by 2 pi and still give you the same wave function. But apart from that modulo 2 pi and 2 pi fact, modulo 2 pi times an integer, for a given wave function, chi zero and theta are always fixed, right? The moment you fix the wave function, chi zero is fixed, theta is fixed. And nothing to do with wave function. Any complex numbers will do that, right? If you write a complex number z as r into the i theta, as long as this number is fixed, r is automatically fixed, theta is fixed up to any multiple of two pi, right? But is there a complex number for which theta can be arbitrary? Any any value for theta will work. Is there any such complex number, or the or the or is the theta fixed or fixed up to two pi times the integer for every complex number? That's the elementary question in complex number theory. Uh, not even theory. Yes, I'm asking you about the argument and the modulus. If I give you a fixed quantum, fixed complex number, is it possible that you can give me any theta whatsoever and it will still work? Say, suppose I give you z equals. Or let's okay, let's be even more explicit. Let's, see. let's say I give you 3 into 1 by root 2 plus i by root. Can you tell me what the r here is and what the theta here is? You want to write this as r with i theta? Yes? Theta is 45. Just to. This cos pi by 4 plus i sine pi by 4. So, can you specify what the value of r is and the value of theta is? What is the value of r here? Q 
Yes. Yeah. Three. Theta is pi by four. Okay. What's the value of theta? Pi by four. Pi by four. Of course, you could say pi by four or pi by four plus twice integer times pi. Where n is zero, one, two, three, minus one, minus two, whatever. But it's not completely arbitrary, right? Theta can only take a value of pi by four or pi by four plus two n times an integer. But is there any so for this particular complex number? Both R and theta are fixed. R completely theta up to multiples of theta. But can you think of any complex number for which theta can be completely arbitrary? That is to say you are changing theta whatever to whatever value you want, and the number still doesn't change. Is it at all possible? To have such a number. And the answer is actually very, very trivial. So this is okay. This is another example of a situation where the answer is so simple that it may not be coming to your mind. But suppose I take r equal to zero, then of course we'll give z equal to zero. The what value of theta? When r is zero, so for z equal to zero, what is the value of theta? Any arbitrary value. Yeah, any value will do, right? This is the one ex exam exception of theta being fixed or at least modulo 2 by fixed when for a given z. When z vanishes, any value of theta will do, right? So the fact that theta cannot change if it, because it's at a point, that argument doesn't work only when the complex number vanishes. In our case, when the wave function vanishes. So all this argument about theta changing, how can theta change by 2 pi or, or by whatever value it was changing by? If you are not moving from a point, that does not work when the wave function vanishes at that point. But what does it mean when you say wave function vanishes at, at that point? Does wave function actually vanish at many points? Where it vanishes, what does it mean for our flow? Yes? At the point the wave function vanishes, what does this mean for our flow? Well, no superfluid present right at that point. That means, after all, remember we are saying that there are lots and lots of atoms which go into making, go into this, this uh, condensate state. But these atoms are real atoms, right? They have a size. That also means that there are gaps between atoms. There are regions where, because of the fact that atoms are hard objects, they can't penetrate each other. There would be non-zero value for the phase. So, sorry, zero value for the for the shy. And those are the points at which theta can take arbitrary values without con, con, without any conflict. Okay. Right? So this theta becoming indeterminate when shy vanishes, that tells you at the microscopic level, you can have regions where you have non-zero circulation. This non-zero circulation, the problem with that is theta changing over a tiny loop. But that's fine because at the center of the tiny loop would be some region where there is there are no atoms, so shy vanishes. So you would have a theta which changes by 2 pi or doesn't change by 2 pi, doesn't really matter. In other words, you have what is called a singularity in the field. The field is not smooth. It's no longer smoothly differentiable. So all of these arguments that we were giving using circulation and being zero because curl is zero, that will simply not work. Okay. So, so what you will have 
not at a huge level of this uh, entire cylinder, but over very tiny regions surrounding a cylinder, you can have circulation. So you can have things like where liquid field lines go like this. Where at the center, there is no atom. Around it, you have tiny vortices, spinning things. Uh, vortices are basically spinning, spinning, spinning fluids. Anybody who has, uh, say, emptied a basin full of water would see the thing spinning round, right? So that's a kind of vortex that is produced. Here, these vortices are basically centered around gaps in the field continuum where there are no atoms. And these are tiny in size. So not the entire fluid, but the fluid, but parts of the fluid will pick up vortices. So, so this is a feature of superfluid flow. You try to make a superfluid spin, you will have tiny vortices come up all over the place. Okay. And what kind of velocity distribution does this vortex, vortex have? That's pretty easy to figure out. Just remember, curl of Vs is zero. That's our guiding principle. And here, because we have a situation like this, things are going round and round like this, right? What kind of a coordinate system would be the best to use here? To describe this kind of velocity motion? Cylinder. A cylindrical polar, right? The cylindrical polar coordinate system is the best suited for this kind of thing. And so, say in cylindrical polar, of course, what you have are three components. The velocity vector would have a radial component. Let me call the radial direction F. Instead of using R, R is, is sort of confusing. It confuses you between. So, S is a distance from the center of the vortex. Okay. It's not a distance from a point, it's a distance from a vertical line. VSS plus, of course, V uh, phi phi. plus v z z hat right this is the basic description and you have these three components but for a field like this which components are there do you have a radial component do you have a component moving outwards or upward you know which way the s hat phi hat and z hat points right in a cylindrical polar coordinate system is that point straight out away from the axis? Phi points across the axis in the tangential direction, phi hat, and then at points along the axis, parallel to the axis. So a velocity field which goes like this, which components would it have? Yes. Remember, all these field lines are sort of spinning around. The fluid is spinning around a central line. So, Vs would have made the thing move away, but it's not moving away, it's moving across, right? Like this. So, which of the three components do you think is there? Are there? Which, there could be more than one. But which ones are there in this kind of flow? Is the question, can you understand the question? So for example, at this point, the S hat vector would be pointing straight away from the thing. The phi hat vector would be pointing perpendicular to it, and Z hat would be pointing right at you, towards the vertical. So. If you look at the velocity, and of course, and this, these vectors depend on where you are. So suppose if you are at this point, it's at this point radially away from this line, phi hat would point like this, and z hat would point again straight up. So, 
and all these points, which of the components, V S, V five, or V Z, which of them are non-zero? Tell me. See. So by the from the picture, it should be obvious. Yeah. Sorry. I couldn't get you. V S is pointing going straight out. Can that be non-zero? Vz. Vz. Vz would be pointing straight at you along the axis. But the velocity is going this way. Right? I can, I've drawn the velocity. It's going round and round. It's actually in the phi hat direction, right? Have, don't you see? This is phi hat. Z hat is pointing along the axis, right towards you. And the velocity is not flowing towards you. Velocity is going round. So actually, Vz is not there, neither is Vs. It's only V5. And from the symmetry of the problem, V5 can only depend on S, the distance from the axis. Now, this is a special case in this case, in this situation. Now, let's go back to a general formula for curl of a vector A, any vector, any vector field, in cylindrical polar coordinates. Just like in Cartesian, curl can be given by a determinant, but it has slightly more complicated form. So the, on top here, just like you had for the Cartesian, where you put i, j, k, here you put s hat phi hat z hat. But there is a catch. This is s times phi hat, the middle vector. That also makes sense, but anyway. And here you have del del s, del del phi, del del z. And here you have Vs, okay, S times V5 and Vz. So that's the formula for curl in cylindrical polar coordinate system where S, phi, and Z are your coordinates. Now, in our, sorry, I made a mistake here. The last line I wrote it down for our vector, but actually it should be A, S, S component. Uh, S times A phi's component and A z component. Now, for us, what will happen is we're actually trying to calculate curl of the superfluid velocity, but I'm not going to use Vs for this simply because I'm already using S for something else. So, let's say V here is our superfluid velocity. So, there, what will happen is there is no Vs, so this will be zero. There's no Vz, this will be zero. And this will be S times. The V5, which is just the V5, is the entire magnitude. So S times V. That's the magnitude of the velocity, right? V5, the entire velocity is in the phi direction. So when you calculate this curl, can you tell me which term will be non? What will be the only contribution to the curl? Z component of the velocity. Uh, to the Z component of that's good. R. What will that be? 1 by S del del S of S V shy, V5. But V5 I can kind of V because uh, the entire V is the magnitude which is entirely along the phi direction. So the Y component is the is v, right? Now, if this is to be true, remember curl of V is 0. So what does this tell me about this small V? Atomer equation. I love is 0 under this geometry actually becomes del 1 by s z hat del del s of s v is 0. I don't know. So, what should be the v? S remember is available, it's a distance from the axis. This is a very trivial equation to solve. Give me the solution to this equation. What is V like? SV is constant. V is a constant. Or SV is a constant. Right. constant. Right. So V is C by S. 
तो v फॉल्स ऑफ एज इनवर्स फर्स्ट पावर ऑफ द डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम द वॉटेक्स व्हिच इज व्हाई दिस इज एक्चुअली अ प्रीटी स्मॉल थिंग अनलेस द सी इज ह्यूज द वेलोसिटी विल वैनिश ऑलमोस्ट वैनिश व्हेन यू आर अवे फ्रॉम द वॉटेक्स सो इट्स इन द लोकल रीजन If you can easily write, so if v is constant by c, then this of course is v phi only. Now v dot d l for a circular loop, the circulation has to be v into d l for the circular loop because v phi and d l vector are in the same direction, and circular loop remember is constant, so we can move out. So c by s into two pi s, right? Put two pi times c. So this kappa is two times two by times two by times c. I already know from the fact that that v is a gradient of theta times h cross by m. This has to be h cross by m. Sorry, h by m into some integer. So it tells me that the capital C constant here is actually h cross by m into some integer. By s, so this is v. v if you, so velocity vector v is this some constant, some integer new into h cross by m into one by s phi hat. So it's in the radial direction falls off inversely as distance. But this should not really come as a surprise. Can anybody tell me why? Where have you seen a field like this? Something which falls off inversely as distance from a line. In which other physical system have you seen this? That should be sort of obvious from what we have already talked about today. We already talked about a kind of field which has zero curl, magnetic field, and but you have infinite line wire, right? That has exactly this dependence. It falls over one by s. So even in fact, I could have got to this result without doing any of the calculation. I could have just said this is exactly like a magnetic field for an infinite state wire, zero curl. Same geometry, you have the same result. So a one by s behavior. So in a vortex, what happens is very close to the center of the vortex. The velocity is very high, and you go far away, the velocity becomes very low. Okay. And for a given vortex, you can be any integer, but typically it's a small integer. So you really don't get any, typically it's of the order one. It's easy, easy to actually uh, sort. Of, these are called winding numbers. It's easy to excite a winding number one vortex. It's become progressively difficult to excite higher order vortices. So each vortex actually can carry this very small circulation, given by h by m, or some multiple of that. Okay. But then what happens if I'm spinning this whole superfluid? And remember, we had this two pi omega r square kappa for this, which is huge. H by m is a tiny. So this h by m, this value for this unit for circulation, is a very tiny quantity, right? H is very very tiny. So this is a very tiny elementary circulation for for a vortex. But if you are setting the liquid spinning with an frequency with an angular velocity omega, and the cylinder's radius is r, then around the edge you have a circulation two pi omega r square. So how do you How do we? First of all, there was this question before: How do you get circulation at all? Uh, because oh. curl is zero. Then you realize that even if curl is zero, the fact that shy vanishes at microscopic points can essentially give you tiny vortices inside. So there could be tiny spinning regions, but each tiny spinning region has an elementary what uh, has a circulation in order of h by m. Which is very tiny compared to by omega r square. To by omega r square is a macroscopically large number. H by m, of course, is microscopically small. 
So, how can you reconcile the fact that, okay, you can have circulation even with a in a cylinder, then by creating very tiny vortices, but the vortices can be very tiny amount of circulation. There are many vortices. Right? Exactly. There will be many, many vortices. And I'm not in a position to draw them because the number of such vortices in, in a fluid like this will be of the order of 2 pi omega r squared by h by m. So m omega r squared by h bar. Right? Or can leave the 2 pi in or so 2m omega into pi r square. Why is this pi r square equal? Pi r square is the area of the loop. So number per unit area, the density of what is per unit area will be essentially twice m omega by h bar. Right? A huge, huge number. So many vortices, not one. And all these vortices circulation adds up for all these vortices and you end up with an overall circulation. And now, so far we have been talking about non-interacting vortices. We have not talked about interaction between particles. And we are not going to talk about interaction of particles in this course. That would be way too, well, way too advanced a topic to deal with here. But basically the vortices actually sort of behave almost like particles. They sort of push each other aside. They, they have an interaction and so on. It turns out that it actually, and by the way, you can experimentally figure out the locations of these vertices. Nowadays, we have experimental observations possible. And theory tells you, and experiments also confirm, confirm this, that because of interactions, intervortex interactions, what typically happens in a spinning liquid is that you have many tiny, many, many tiny vortices, and the tiny vortices are not completely randomly situated. They're typically situated over on a hexagonal lattice. So you have a fluid, and you don't really have a crystal structure there. After all, these vortices are not really atoms. These are parts of the fluid which are spinning around, but the vortices essentially sit on corners of, on the lattice types of hexagonal lattice, at least uh, to a very high degree of approximation, you get a hexagonal structure. This can be theoretically proven. This is experimentally observed, although frankly, it's not very easy to observe. So this idea about vortices, uh, what is the existence of vortices is one of the very important uh, con conclusions that you can draw from the fact that superfluid flow is irrotational. Irrotational, yet it rotates. It rotates via formation of vortices around singular points, around points where the density of the fluid vanishes. Okay. So any questions about this? Because uh, I will have to make a start on the next bit, which is the, which is further consequence of this microscopic theory. But any questions about this? Okay, if not, let's move on to the to a deeper aspect of this. So far, we have actually talked about shy RT. This. as basically a function, a function for some, some uh, condensed state in which macroscopic number of particles reside. But we have not talked about uh, anything about the dynamics of this wave function itself, or try to talk about how the, how the way in which the wave function changes is going to affect changes in theta, changes in n, or as a result, changes in v, and so on. Okay, so what Landau did was not just talked about these vortices and things, he cooked up a full fledged microscopic theory for this thing, starting with the fact that this is basically the wave function which is shared by each of these condensate molecules. So basically, it's like a single particle wave function, it's just that many, many particles occupy that particular wave function, are in the same state. So if it's a single particle wave function, what kind of uh, equation would it obey? 
What is the basic equation? Schrodinger. Schrodinger equation, exactly. But there is a catch in the Schrodinger equation for a single particle wave function. Uh, okay, I should, I'm including the H cross in all these calculations, so I will put that in. This part is fine. But in addition to this, what you have should be a potential. Okay. And this potential is really not a single particle potential. After all, you don't really ha have a single particle interaction, right? This kind of single particle Schrodinger equation can be written down only if these particles were really independent. Otherwise, you would have to write down a Schrodinger equation involving all the particles together, right? The Hamiltonian will not have just a single particle kinetic energy term and a single particle potential energy term. It will be a sum over kinetic energy terms for all particles and potential energy terms involving all the particles. So what we are doing here is basically looking at this in what is at what is called the independent particle approximation, which is a very commonly used approximation. And which works pretty well, except that you have to figure out what this V is. This V is not the actual potential energy of interaction because that would be an interaction for each particle with each particle, not for one particle. But this is an effective potential. Some kind of mean field value. You have done uh, uh, things like uh, Hartree-Fock and Hartree and stuff like that, right? Or independent particle approximation, have you done this? Yes or no? Yes, sir. This independent... So you know that basic, and you have also the mean field theory. So this is an effective potential which has to be used. Now in a superfluid, we can argue that there is a way of identifying this effective potential with something which has a grave great thermodynamic meaning. And that thing is, so in the V, what we will do is we will replace it by a thermodynamic entity, which will be the effective potential. This is the chemical potential. We will argue why this is the case, but maybe maybe I will not be able to carry out the full argument today. But uh, basically, what Landau argued was you can talk about the dynamics of this shy RT and use that to figure out things about how velocities, etc., evolve in time. And for that, you have to assume that chi R T essentially obeys an uh, independent particle approximation version of Schrodinger's equation. And one of his major contributions was to identify that the effective potential here should be something which is familiar to us, or should be familiar to us from thermodynamics. So you recognize what this thing is, the mu, the chemical potential? Where does it occur in thermodynamics? Internal energy, change in internal energy. Change in internal energy for what? Under what condition? The du, right? Change in internal energy is for an infinitesimal change will be du equal to what is the formula for this? TDS minus PDV plus mu dn. Okay, this last part plus mu dn is often omitted. In elementary thermodynamics, because in elementary thermodynamics, we often talk about a system which is fixed in its number of molecules. If the number of molecules are fixed, then of course TDS minus PDV is the only term that you have. That is why very often, at least in first year thermodynamics, we study U as TDS minus PDV because we are talking about closed systems, systems with a fixed number of particles. But this is the full formula, TDS minus PDV plus mu dn. Where mu essentially tells you is basically del u del n, the rate at which u changes with n, okay, with at fixed s fixed v. So if you hold a system at a fixed volume and make it undergo adiabatic and adiabatically manage to push in one molecule or one constant particle, 
the change in the internal energy will be the chemical potential. Okay. So chemical potential is how much work you would have to do to push in one particular particle without changing the entropy or the volume. Which sort of tells you why it is sitting here in the potential energy place. It's related to the amount of work you have to do to change number of particles, but we will make a more, uh, we will give a better argument for this later on. But today what we, what I'm going to do is essentially lay down the groundwork in the time left by recalling some basic thermodynamics. Uh, of course, everything would know, but uh, can anybody tell me what is this? Is this familiar to anybody? You internal energy. Is this? Why? You internal energy. Why is this? After all, uh, U is du is TGS minus P D plus mu dm, right? And un under no stretch of imagination is T P and mu constants. If they were, they were constants, then of course you could say du is this simply tells you use the integral, which is T S minus P D plus mu dm. Right? You all agree that this is the correct equation which follows this basically the combined first and second law of thermodynamics plus the, with the possibility of open systems, systems which leak particles or the particle number changes. Now, if that is correct, how is it possible that U is also Ts minus Pd plus mu one? If you integrate this equation, getting to Ts minus Pg plus mu one seems almost impossible, right? Unless T, P and mu were constants, which of course they are not. Yes? Uh, you all know what this will that u is T S minus P V plus V1. Do you know this or at least one of you know this, but is this common knowledge? Everybody knows this. The fact that u is actually T S minus P V plus V1. Along with du being TDS minus PGB plus mu dn is a consequence of u being a special kind of function. And that's a very familiar special kind of function in thermodynamics. Okay, suppose I take u. Okay, what are the variables which go in u? What variables describe the system? Uh, that is u function. It's a function of what? What is u a function? Svn. Okay, why do you say Svn? Why not temperature? For example, the most common formula that we know of internal energy is that of a monoatomic free particle, right? Monoatomic ideal gas. The formula for that is 3 by 2 nRT, isn't it? Isn't this correct? Yes, sir. Is this a function of SVN? It is a function of N. I can see the N here. So if N were the number of moles, it will be small n, small n RT, or capital N KV, Boltzmann mass and T. Same thing. But you do see the N here, but I can't see the S or the V. Instead, I see T. So isn't this a function of n and t, not of SVNN? Yes?
Okay, so this is a very, this actually is a very important question in thermodynamics. And uh, saying that u is a function of SVN simply because you have ds, dv, dn in this expression, that actually is completely useless because, uh, if, for example, here u is 3 by 2 nrt, and if I did a du, I would get 3 by 2 nrdt if n were fixed or plus 3 by 2 rt dn, right? So, in other words, I can actually change your weight, change variables, right? I can, instead of using SV and I could use another set. The reason why we say U is a function of SV and in particular is that this function, if you're given this, it has complete thermodynamic information. Once this thing is given, you know everything about the thermodynamics of the system. If you were given this, for example, 3 by 2 NRT, can you tell me what the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature is from here? If you are, if somebody tells you that you have a system in which the internal energy is some constant into n into t, will you be able to figure out the pressure versus PVT relationship? The mechanical equation state from here. No, sir. Yeah, you cannot. But if you were given this, then notice that this tells you the temperature can be found out by doing del u del s, which will come out as a function of SVN, right? Pressure can be to be done by del u del v, which again will come out to be some function of SVN. And if you eliminate S between these two equations, you will be able to find temperature as a function of pressure and volume and number of particles. Right? In other words, this alone, this can only tell you things like what is the heat capacity. It can tell you how internally it changes when temperature changes. But this equation, from this you cannot figure out that PV is equal to NRT. But if you were given u as a function of S, V, and N, from that you can figure out everything that you can want to about the system. That is why you say u is a function of S, V, N. Otherwise, it's a stupid statement to make, right? After all, you can change your variables. But the point is, if you express u as a function of S, V, and N, you have full information. Similarly, if you express the enthalpy as a function of S, P, and N, you have full information, and so on. So when people say enthalpy is a function of SP and N or gives me energy is a part of function of a TP and N, they specifically mean that if you express these potentials in terms of those particular variables, then you have full thermodynamic information about the system. Otherwise, you don't have full information. Right? You understand what I'm saying here? So People often say that, okay, when I write u minus t, uh, sorry, u plus pv, for example, anybody recognize what this is? We add pv to u. What is this point? Of course, I realize that it has been a long time, but after all, some of you are going to give net or other exams. So you would need to know these things. And these are very elementary things. Everybody needs to know these. What function is u plus pv? Yes? What is this particular function that we are talking about? This ring a bell? Hamiltonian, right? But I'm kidding, it's not the Hamiltonian, it's the enthalpy. And dh, very often the kind of argument you see is this TDS uh, minus PDV plus mu dn plus d of PV, and that gives you this. And that is why you say S, it's a function of S, P, and N. That actually is the wrong argument. The result is right, but enthalpy is a function of S, is is not a function of S, P, and N by default. But if you express it as a function of S, P, and N, you have full information. 
By the way, this kind of thing happens not only in thermodynamics, it also happens in mechanics. Uh, what am I talking about? Which particular kind of function am I talking about in mechanics? When you change, have to change your variables to get full information about the dynamics? Remember the Lagrangian? What is the Lagrangian a function of? Yes, Lagrangian of a system. Say a point particle moving in a potential. What, what is the Lagrangian a function? I'm not asking what function is it, I'm just asking what does it depend upon? Yes, this is this is again an elementary question. What does Lagrangian depend upon? Q dot t. Q q dot t. And if you know this function, you can figure out everything about the motion of the system. At least you get equations which can tell you everything about the motion of the system. But then from L, you calculate this thing called P, del L del Q dot. Of course, there will be more than one, I'm just writing one. And then you form this quantity. Now, when you form this quantity, what is it a function of? When you're calculating this, what, what say, simple, half M, mx dot square plus v of x, sorry, minus v of x, the Lagrangian for a point particle moving in a potential in one dimension. So this, this is your Lagrangian. The momentum is del L del x dot, that's mx dot. Right, the momentum depends on x, x dot and t. In this simple case, it does not depend on x, x, but it does depend on x dot. And so when you calculate px dot minus L, what you get is mx dot square, mx dot into x dot, minus L, and that works out to be half mx dot square plus v of x, right, after you do the calculation. What physical quantity is this? For this system, what kind of an, what is this called? Hamilton. Actually, no. This is close, but this is actually called the Jacobi function. In more advanced dynamics text, or you don't even need to call it anything because that's not what you use. What you do is take this function, eliminate x dot, and write it in terms of p. That is, you use the fact that x dot is p by m and write this as p square by twice m plus v of x. And this is the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian, remember, is not a function of x, x dot t or q, q dot t, it's a function of q, p, t. And that makes a huge difference. The Lagrangian as a function of q, q dot t has full information. The Hamiltonian expresses a function of q, p, t, again has full information about the dynamics of the system. This function, the intermediate function that you got here, is not the Hamiltonian, despite the fact that it is numerically equal to it. That's the connection between these potentials. Also, in fact, it's the same connection. What you do when you go from a Lagrangian to Hamiltonian is exactly the same thing that you do when you go from U to H or U to F or F to G or whatever. And that's called a Lagrange transform. I will not talk about a lot about this because after all, thermodynamics or mechanics is not my... Ah, sorry, it's not called a Lagrange transform. Another L, Lahore legendary transform. This legendary transform is a very important tool which allows us to collect all of these together. And uh, I would urge all of you to at least read up on this. If no one book where you will definitely find this is in Callan's book on thermodynamics, there's a beautiful description of what why this is why you have to do this. It's not very trivial. It's a non-trivial thing that you do when you go from one potential to another. But all this is really not my topic. My topic today was basically, okay, I will have to wrap up today, but let's remember we said you as a function of SBN have complete information. But suppose I have two copies of the system. What will uh, you become? 
if you have two identical copies of the system, what is the total internal energy? If one, for one is you, what is it for two copies? To you, right? Of course, S, V, and N, each of these variables become double, right? For the com S becomes doubled, V becomes doubled, N becomes doubled, right? You have two identical copies of the system, right? Yes, sir. If you have lambda identical copies, they will each become lambda times, which is what, what, what do you call such variables? Variables which scale up with the number of copies of the system. In thermodynamics, they have a special name. Each one of these variables actually are extensive variables. Remember the extensive and intensive variables that we talked about? Temperature is intensive. Take two identical systems, each at 300 Kelvin, the overall system will be at 300 Kelvin. It will not be at 600 Kelvin. Right? But volume, take two gases, one liter each. The, if you combine them together, if you think of them as one system, the volume is two, two liters. Entropy doubles or becomes lambda times. So one important property of extensive variables is this. If you were to scale up every one of these, since U depends only on S, V, and N, if you scale up S by lambda, V by lambda, N by lambda, same factor, the overall U, must become lambda times what it was. This was in maths long ago, in maybe the first year or the second year. Homogeneous functions of degree n, in this case, first degree. Basically, this is lambda to the 1, that's why this is first degree. And there was a theorem, which you should have studied then, but very people, few people actually remember that from the mass pass courses, something called Euler's theorem for extensive variables. The proof actually is very simple. Suppose I were to differentiate both sides. So I'm not going to tell you what the theorem is. I'm just going to prove the result for you. If I were to differentiate both sides with respect to lambda, what will happen on the left-hand side? What will you get on the, on the left? Yes? You differentiate this with Where is the lambda here? Only here, right? So if I differentiate this with a lambda, what will you get? W, w dallas s. Which one? Which one? On this side. Oh, that one. Um, yeah. With respect to? Lambda. I'm going to differentiate both sides with just a lambda. On the right, what will you get? USVM. You just get us again, right? On the left, del on the del left, is, you, del u del s into del del del, del lambda into, of lambda. So, it's, yeah, that's del u del v plus n del u del s. Actually, del u del of lambda s, del u del of lambda v, and u will be a lambda. So what we will do is, I will differentiate this as a lambda, and then at the end, put lambda equal to 1. So this, they didn't get this. On the right-hand side, you don't have to do anything, because right-hand side, you just have u. The lambda has gone away. On the left, you get this. And what is del u del s? Anybody remember that? Temperature. Yeah, so this is Ts. This is minus P, so minus PB. That's mu n. Okay, so the, this formula that U is TS minus PB plus mu n is not something you get by integrating TDS minus PDB plus mu dn. You get it from the fact that U is a homogeneous function of the first degree of S, V, and N. In other words, here, uh, each of these variables are extensive variables. 
That is why you have this formula. Okay. And of course, if you have this, an immediate consequence of this will be what should this be? Remember, we already know that du has to be TDS minus TDB plus mu ds. And because it's a homogeneous function of the first degree, you is so what is this? Zero. Right. So both of these, either this or this, they are called Gibbs to have relations. One of them is the integral version, there's a differential version. And we will need the Gibbs Gibbs relation in a big way in the next class, simply because I will need to know here, basically d mu. What does it work out to be? It simply works out to be minus s by n dt, okay, plus v by n dt. Right? So it tells you that if you were to change the temperature of the or the pressure of the system, chemical potential will change. <clears throat> Not only that, we will also tell you how fast they will change. This change will depend on the entropy per number of mole per unit molecules, and this will depend on the volume per number of molecules. So a more dense system, which has more more number of particles per volume, that is smaller value of V by N, that will have a smaller change in mu when you change its pressure. Uh, a system with a higher entropy, higher specific entropy, will have larger changes in mu when temperature changes. These are things we are going to need in the next class. So this is, of course, old stuff, basic thermodynamics. But we actually need this basic thermodynamics to talk about uh, superfluid flow, Landau's version. Okay. And just one question which I need to ask you before I let you go, which is this thing, Euler or convectional derivative. You know what that is? Have you heard of this term, Euler derivative or convectional derivative? Or something which looks like Have you heard of this? You may not have, but if you haven't fine, we'll then because this basically is a very fundamental thing in fluid flow, but because hydrodynamics is hardly ever taught in most courses that we have, uh, very often people don't really know what this thing really is. But we will need this in a big way when you talk about fluid, because we are going to talk about superfluid flow, right? That's our aim. We are going to talk about superfluid flow, also the flow of the normal liquid along with that. So we will need to set up equations which describe that flow. And in that, the Euler or convectional derivative plays a huge role. Nothing to do with superfluidity or quantum mechanics. This is basically standard hydrodynamics. It's just the standard hydrodynamics is not taught very often. So have you seen this before? Anybody of you? No, sir. Okay, fine. So next year we will have to also build this up. At least explain what this means. So next day we are going to study the proper theory of super, the, the well, the theory of superfluid physics in the sense that so far we have been talking about various phenomena in superfluidity. But after all, superfluidity is about superfluid. So how does the superfluid flow differ from normal fluid flow? The mathematical theory behind that, starting from the quantum picture that we have here, that is that of a macroscopic wave function which obeys an equation like this, we are going to try to talk about that. So that will be for the next day. Uh, let me just ask you one thing. Um, next day, this Tuesday, Thursday, I'm not really available. Uh, Friday is a holiday. But uh, are you OK with doing a class on Friday? You know Friday is a holiday, right? You do? Yes or no? Fourteenth of April. 
So Saturday. Yes. Saturday is what? You will like Saturday. Is that what you are saying, or? Yes, sir. Saturday will be better. Saturday at eleven. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, Saturday at eleven. Then it is done. So this this class, remember, is for the for the last week. I couldn't take the class then. So this week's class will be on Saturday eleven. Okay. Bye for today.